Welcome to the PCN Capital Preview. I'm Francine Scherzer. Today we'll discuss the state's minimum wage. If you'd like to join the discussion, you can call us at 1-877-PA-6501, text us at 717-219-4001, and we'll also take questions from PCN's Facebook page submitted earlier. But first, we're joined today by Angela Columbus, investigative reporter for Spotlight PA. Angela, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. Over the weekend, you broke the story uh, that the Shapiro administration uh, paid $295,000 in a settlement to, set to settle sexual harassment allegations against a top aide. Uh, before we get into this, give us a brief background for those that may not be familiar with this case. Right. So uh, the Shapiro administration came into office in January and one of his top advisors and longtime top advisors, Mike Verib, joined him as his uh, legislative liaison. It's a top position in, this, in, in the administration. That is the person that basically, uh, you know, uh, forges relationships with the legislature and helps get the agenda through. Uh, so Mike Verib was accused uh, back in, um, uh, well, started in March, but uh, formally in May of sexually harassing a woman who worked for the governor's office. And then that case uh, later settled, as you mentioned, for $295,000. So as you mentioned, the, the settlement was signed three weeks before Mike Farab actually resigned from his position. Why was so much time allowed to lapse before that happened? Nobody knows the answer to that, and we are still trying to get to that answer. However, it has been raised by Republicans, uh, Republican women in the state Senate, led by uh, President Kim Ward. Uh, the question is a valid one. Uh, what happened, uh, not just in between when the settlement was signed and the resignation occurred, but also what happened prior to that. The complaint was filed in May, um, and we don't really know the details of what followed, but an entire summer elapsed before a settlement was signed and then uh, another three weeks before the resignation took place. Senate President Pro Tem Kim Ward uh, said that the Senate should hold a hearing to discuss what happened and how these allegations were handled. Have you received any indication whether that's going to move forward? And if so, what are senators hoping to gather from this? Uh, no indication yet that there will be an actual hearing on this. Uh, I think that there are some in the Shapiro administration who believe that that would be politically motivated. Um, there have been some high profile and in, in the past, not in the state Senate necessarily, but in the state house, there have been some high profile sexual harassment settlements. And so, uh, you know, there is a sense on the administration's part that that would be disingenuous um, and that the legislature really should look to toward its own policies before looking at the administration's. Has the Shapiro administration taken any additional steps to prevent similar allegations or similar incidents from happening again in the future? Well, one of the things that's included in the settlement agreement is the promise of uh, sexual harassment training for people in the governor's office and specifically in the policy area where uh, Mike Farab worked. Um, but they have said that they have, uh, quote unquote, robust uh, procedures in place to address these things when they occur. And I guess uh, I, I should add and should have added earlier that the administration in the actual settlement denied uh, wrongdoing in this case. Governor Shapiro is rumored to be running for president. Will this incident hurt him politically? It's hard to know because uh, it's really early on in his administration and it, it is really the first scandal, so, so to speak, that he's had to deal with um, and a very difficult public relations minefield. Uh, but, it, you know, it is so early in his administration and there are going to be so many other things that will overtake this. But I do think that he has to be careful to he has built his image on being a uh, champion for survivors. And so he really has to make sure that that image continues into the future. Angela Columbus, investigative reporter for Spotlight PA. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. We're going to take a brief break and we'll be back with more of the PCN Capital Preview. Did you know you can watch all of your favorite PCN originals and more at home or on the go? Download the PCN app on your favorite device and tune in to see what makes Pennsylvania's heart beat. Watch videos on demand, see multiple live streams, and check out the free selected programs and events. PCN. Pennsylvania politics and policy. 
history and culture, sports, and more. Welcome back. Today we're joined by Stephen Bloom, Vice President at the Commonwealth Foundation and Stephen Herzenberg, Executive Director of the Keystone Research Center. Um, Steve, we'll start with you. For the last nine years, uh, Democrat, a Democratic governor has requested a minimum wage increase and it has not moved through the legislature. Uh, moreover, House Speaker Joanna McClinton had recently, uh, last month, predicted that a minimum wage increase would happen this fall. Do you think the environment is right to do that at this time? The environment's better than it's been in a long time. I mean, the bill that already passed the House was actually a companion bill to a Senate bill sponsored by Republican Dan Laughlin, who is the chair of the Republican Policy Committee. And so and when he introduced his bill, he talked about this being the responsible thing to do and talked about the fact that families can't put food on the table, can't cover their basic costs at seven twenty-five an hour. That's $15,000 a year for full-time workers. So I think there's an awareness now that with 30 states having a higher minimum wage, with three states uh, near us being at or on a path to $15 an hour, that, that Pennsylvania does need an adjustment so that low-wage workers can share in the benefits of what is now a, a fairly strong economy. And well, Francine, well, uh, in fact, the political environment may be better for the idea of passing a minimum wage increase bill uh, as things stand currently. In terms of actually making a difference, it's really never been less relevant to even be talking about increasing the minimum wage because the market has done its job. Wages are rising. They've gone far above any proposed uh, mandatory minimum. And in fact, there's a competition for employees and it's causing wages to rise. Wages are in many cases rising faster than the rate of inflation. Workers are getting ahead. And that's not because of a law that says you can't you can't pay a worker less than 725. It's because the market needs workers and, and the money is pouring into the market to hire those workers and get the get the jobs done that we need to get done. I'd like to welcome our viewers to the Peace and Capital Preview. If you'd like to join our discussion about the minimum wage, you can call us toll free 1-877-PA-65001, or you can text us at 717-219-4001. Um, now, you both had mentioned um, there are bills that are moving in both the House and the Senate. Um, Senator, Pat, uh, Senator Christine Tartaglione and Representative Patty Kim have been spearheading uh, this initiative for years. Um, and um, Stephen, as you had mentioned, Dan Laughlin um, has his proposal as well once again. Uh, Steve, I'd like to ask you, do you think that it helps having a Republican push this initiative in the Senate? I think it, it recognizes the fact that there are some Republicans who are concerned about this. But again, it's the question of whether or not this gets passed is almost the most. It, it has the least impact on, on the actual workers. Or if you look at who's who's actually earning the minimum wage in Pennsylvania or nationally, it's about one point four percent of hourly workers. So first of all, you have all the people who work for salary. They're not impacted at all by minimum, minimum wage law like that. And then you have, of the workers who are hourly, 1.4% making minimum wage. Primarily, almost half are young people, teens and, and college age people who are literally just trying to earn a little extra income on the side. Uh, other categories are, are uh, retired folks and people who are just, again, trying to, trying to earn a few extra dollars they're not looking for full-time employment. They're not living on that. They're just looking for a little extra income. And that's been the case for, for at least a decade. There are very, very few people even in that realm who are making minimum wage. And those that, that are there are typically there by their own choosing. And they could easily uh, accept a more, a more robust offer if they wanted to put in more time at, at a company or an institution. And it's just their choice that they're doing that. So the, 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 the big question in my mind is, sure, we could pass laws mandating a higher minimum wage. But when the market's already doing that job, we should really be focusing on the other things that can increase prosperity of Pennsylvanians, like a better regulatory environment to allow businesses to invest here, a better tax environment to allow businesses to be attracted here instead of moving to other states with lower taxes. So there's things we can do to really help workers. The minimum wage is about the most irrelevant of those things because it impacts so few. Stephen, do you agree with that sure. assessment of who the minimum wage workers are? Well, so no. I mean, um, uh, the minimum wage at 7.25 an hour 
is not very relevant because most workers have moved above that. But a minimum wage at $15 an hour, as proposed by Republican Dan Laughlin, phased in over about three years, uh, would benefit more than 20 percent of Pennsylvania workers, 1.3 million Pennsylvania workers. Uh, uh, one in six of those workers would be 55 and over, more than the number of teens. If you look at the border areas in Pennsylvania next to New Jersey and um, New York, what you find, and Maryland, what you find is at the low end of the labor market, uh, yes, wages have gone up some in Pennsylvania, but they've gone up much more in the states that have raised their uh, minimum wage of $15 an hour. You're talking about $1.30, $1.40 an hour. So you're talking about for a full-time, full-year worker, $3,000, $4,000 a year. People in your audience know that the market but also public policy matters, and two-thirds or more of Pennsylvanians, including, uh, according to the polls that we've helped do, over 50 percent of constituents in every Republican legislative district in the state support a higher minimum wage. It's time to make this modest change. It's not a panacea, but it'll make a profound difference to the lives of a lot of working families. But the, the other piece of this, though, when we look at proposals like what, what Stephen is talking about, there's a downside. There have been a couple of studies done specifically on what that would, what the impact would be of those kind of bills becoming law in Pennsylvania, and it does cause job loss. It causes the loss of anywhere from, depending on, on the amount of the ultimate rate of minimum wage set under the bill, it varies, but anywhere from 43,000 jobs to almost 140,000 jobs would be lost if Pennsylvania does enact a mandatory higher minimum wage law, law as, as, being, as being discussed. And in particular, the people who would lose those jobs, the, the sectors that those jobs would be lost in, are the exact type of sector where most minimum wages, minimum wage workers would be attracted. The, the entertainment industry, the, the um, tourism, travel industry, service industries like that, that's where the jobs would be lost. So the very people who need those entry level jobs or, or who need those, those jobs working on a part time basis while they're in school and so forth would end up losing the opportunity to have those jobs. And those that have jobs, would lose hours. So there's a, there's a downside here. It may actually increase the income of some workers, but others will simply lose a job altogether. So you're talking, and you're talking again, anywhere from 40,000 to 140,000, depending on how far you go with mandating the, the increase. There's a, a lot of evidence and experience now that if we increase the minimum wage now, it won't cost jobs. There are competing effects in terms of when you're unemployment when it comes to raising the minimum wage. Some positive effects are it puts money in the pockets of working families so they can buy more local businesses. Another critical effect right now is that employers can recruit and retain people. So. Uh, across the country, the leisure and hospitality industry has really struggled to get uh, to attract and hold on to workers. They have a higher uh, job openings rate than at any other point in history. Interestingly enough, you've got employers on the border with Pennsylvania in New York paying more that are getting workers, whereas workers, whereas employers in Pennsylvania are struggling at that 725 minimum wage. What you've actually got is more Pennsylvania workers going to New York to get a living wage job, and you've got fewer New York workers coming into Pennsylvania to take a poverty wage job. So the good news right now is in addition to helping working families, that higher minimum wage actually is going to help businesses because they can find the people they need to serve you at the local restaurant. We, many people in Pennsylvania have had the experience in the last year or two that service is very slow. You've got one or two people running around like a chicken with their head cut off trying to, to take care of too many customers. That slows the growth of those businesses. That slows the job creation of the, those businesses. So right now, we're at a point where a sensible minimum wage increase to catch up to some of the states around us is going to be benefit workers, going to be benefit employers, and going to be benefit all of us because it'll help drive the economy forward. Is the minimum wage intended to be a life-sustaining wage? Again, there's a lot of historical debate about this, but yes, in the, in the 1930s when the minimum wage, wage was created, one of its central purposes, that was the Great Depression, one of the central purposes was to enable uh, families that had jobs to put bread on the table to, to pay their rent. So, um, and then for the next 30 years, you actually had Congress five or six times increase the minimum wage to keep up 
uh, with the manufacturing wage to remain about half of the manufacturing wage. So yes, for the first 30 years uh, in, after its uh, implementation nationally, the, the minimum wage was understood to be one of the ways in which you enable working families generally to make a living wage. But even, even back then, it was the, the increase in wages in the private sector that was driving the increases in the government trying to, to catch up with the market. The market was already providing jobs that were paying well over minimum wage. And in fact, if you look at the growth of real wages over the years, real wages have increased. The, the workers in America or in Pennsylvania overall are better off than they would have been, for example, in the 1930s, drastically. And it's not, it's not been the fact that the government set a bottom low standard for wages. It's the fact that companies invested in, in Pennsylvania and co companies invested in America and grew here and it was that growth that generated the increase in wages that allowed so many more Pennsylvanians and so many more Americans to be prosperous. The other thing that's really important to look at when we talk about minimum wage, if we increase Pennsylvania's minimum wage, there's another, another downside, again, that hurts the most the folks at the lowest rung of the economic ladder, which is inflation. And we've seen multiple studies that increasing minimum wage actually drives the increases in inflation. And we've seen over the past three years of a, a increase in the rate of inflation like we haven't seen since the 1970s or early 1980s. And as that, that, that peak increase has slowed down a little bit, there's still an increase. And, and just the most recent figures that came out, it's over 3% again. And keep in mind, when the rate of increase in inflation goes down, it's not putting you back to where you were when the prices were lower. It's just increasing them more slowly. To keep up with that, it's not that we require mandates from the government, it's we require the private sector to do what it's best at, which is create jobs, invest, and provide goods and services that the public wants so we can generate high paying, good jobs, and not be talking about the, the very small sliver of the economic market that is folks who are making minimum wage. Again, 1.4% of, of the, the whole workforce of hourly workers are the only ones who need to be affected. Let's take a call from Lewisburg now. Paul, you're on PCN. Thank you. As a citizen of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I'm always surprised by the argument of the minimum wage. I ran a business for several years myself, and uh, frankly, I don't understand why the attraction of the raising of the minimum wage is, is always uh, brought up, mostly by left-wing Democrats and so forth, and I'm really disappointed to hear that the Republicans support it as well. Look, I feel that some people are worth 50 cents an hour, some are worth a dollar an hour, some are worth $5 or $7 an hour. When we raise the minimum wage, it's nothing but government interference in the, in the free enterprise system of the United States of America. That's, that's how I see it. And uh, if, 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 if $7 is not enough and $15 sounds better, why not raise it to $50 an hour, $100 an hour? Why not do that? And certainly, at, at, if, you, if you want to listen to the, to the, the ideas Paul expressed, I mean, in fact, why not? Why wouldn't you raise it to $100 an hour? People recognize immediately that that would be impractical and inappropriate. That's really not the argument we're having today, though. The question is, is this where we, where we can do the most good for people who are trying to climb the economic ladder? But let me jump in here, because um, what Paul's doing, and, and a little bit what Steve Bloom is doing, is imagining something that doesn't exist, which is a market without any policies. It's as if the, the, the caller is almost seems to want to go back to a 1900s economy and Dickensian days in which workers worked 70 hours a week and uh, in dangerous conditions. What actually happened is over the next century, we created a combination of policies, no child labor, a minimum wage, ultimately laws that made it possible for people to form unions. And so then what happened in the glorious decades from the 1930s to the 1960s is you had a powerful market. You know, we absolutely expanded mass production, the most, uh, the most powerful mass production economy in the world. Uh, the, the, the decades of the two-car garage and, and families saw their incomes double from the 1930s to the 1960s. But that was partly because you had the minimum wage going up at the bottom, and you had middle-class blue-collar wages going up in the middle because you had collective bargaining. So it was a combination of a very powerful market economy, but sensible policies that led to people sharing in the benefits of growth, and then their consumption continuing to drive the economy forward. So Steve talks about people 
at the bottom seeing their wages go up faster than inflation over time. In fact, if you look since the 1940s, the vast uh, majority of the increase in those workers' incomes in that, what, 80-year period took place in the first 20 years when we had steady increases in real terms, doubling the minimum wage in 20-plus years. So again, it's a matter of sensible policies and a powerful market um, so that you, you get strong economic growth, uh, productivity growth, but you also get people generally sharing in the benefits of that growth, which helps actually keep the economy going forward. We got away from that in the 70s and particularly in the early 80s, and, and that's why the economy has grown more slowly since then and why wages haven't increased much over time. To look back at our caller, though, how do you determine what the appropriate rate should be? Uh, it's called pragmatism. <laughs> it's, it's called, clearly you don't want a minimum wage of $30 an hour. You don't want a minimum wage that's at or above the, the, the wage paid in the middle. Again, I, I told you the history of congressional increases in the 40s and the 50s and 60s was they pegged it to about half the manufacturing wage. So you could peg it to like half the median wage, the wage of the middle wage worker. So it's something like that. It's so that low wage workers are still paid less. You know, it's still significantly markets have a powerful influence on what people are paid, but you set a floor so that those people can feed their families too, and so you don't get extreme growth of inequality. Steve, if I could go back to something you said a little sure. earlier in the show, you had said that uh, the idea of increasing the minimum wage seemed irrelevant right now because there's so many private industries that are paying at a higher rate. If that's the case, is there still the threat of job loss if that rate, that bottom rate were to increase? There is, and in, in particular, uh, there are several sectors that are most vulnerable to that. One of them is the nonprofit sector. If you look at organizations that serve, for example, the needs of intellectually disabled adults or organizations that are doing hands-on work to help those in poverty, if, and you talk to their, their, their executive directors or their, their board members, they are already having a very difficult time keeping up with, with the wage growth that we've experienced because, yes, the economy is thriving. And people are, are, are going to places where they can get the best jobs. And so in many cases, these, these agencies that are just trying to do good, nonprofit agencies trying to help Pennsylvanians, they're the ones suffering when the, the, the um, minimum wage is increased because it increases their overhead but doesn't help them to increase the ability to serve their, their, their constituents and their customers. Is there any correlation between uh, what the rate of minimum wage is and employee productivity or the rate of turnover? Is there any data to, to uh, correlate those? So there's certainly historical data. I mean, again, when, when the federal minimum wage was established in the 1930s, um, there were some low-wage southern industries where that minimum wage was set at like 70 percent of the uh, you know, the, 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 uh, seventy percent of the wages in the, some of those southern industries were below the new federal minimum wage. So, so part of what you got in the, the decades from the 30s and particularly the 40s to the 60s is you you um, you had actually had a lot of automation, and you uh, because workers um, cost more. Um, but in the end, that translated into 3% a year productivity growth. That's part of what, you, you know, you need a combination of fast productivity growth and workers seeing their wages grow at the at roughly the rate of productivity. That, that's how you get a rising tide that lifts all boats. And so, yes, there's uh, absolutely data that shows what, what really matters to, to living standards in the long run is productivity growth. And so implemented sensibly, a higher minimum wage can be part of what drives employers to do something more creative than squeeze their workers and to adopt uh, automation uh, over time. And, you know, that magic formula worked great for a couple of decades. And again, we've uh, went away from that approach and, and productivity growth has been more sluggish uh, since uh, about 1980. And that's the point I think Stephen and I would, would agree on, that productivity growth is the key. And we were talking about you know, the, the 20th century and, and all the, the leaps and bounds that the American economy experienced during that time. Now it's 2023. Is moving, is changing the minimum wage the most productive policy we can pursue today? Certainly not. We could, we could do other things that will have a much more productive impact on the economy and creating jobs here in Pennsylvania if we look at tax policy and regulatory policy instead of focusing so much effort and so much political energy on the idea of of raising 
a minimum wage that has already been bypassed by market conditions. We, can, we, we are in a competition here in Pennsylvania with other states. And it's not just the states around us. It's not just Ohio, West Virginia, New York, those, those states. But we're competing with states all across the country, North Carolina, Texas, Arizona, places where economic growth is happening because of changes in policy, such as simplifying and lowering taxes on individuals and businesses, changes in policies like making sure the regulatory environment is realistic and doesn't overly restrict, that it does in fact protect people from dangers and hazards, but doesn't overly restrict the ability of the market to, to, to respond to competition. So we are losing residents in Pennsylvania every, every cycle, every 10-year uh, reapportionment cycle. We lose a co a co an office of a, co a congressional representative of Pennsylvania in Washington. This loss is, is made up by people fleeing Pennsylvania for those other states where they have better tax policy and regulatory policy. That's where we need to focus, making sure Pennsylvania is in the thick of that. That allows us to be more productive, and we should be looking at what policies are productive, not ones, which ones are popular that don't actually help most Pennsylvanians. If a, if a minimum wage were to increase, would that lessen the burden of Pennsylvanians that are drawing from, for example, uh, Department of Human Service benefits? Sure. I mean, um, a lot of social programs um, are what's called needs tested. And so whether or not you're eligible for child care or uh, food stamps or, you know, other public assistance de depends on your family income. And so what, what does happen is um, if the minimum wage is a lot higher, then more families are able to support themselves without public assistance. So that's a benefit to the taxpayer in addition to um, the worker and their family. We'll continue our discussion on the minimum wage in just a moment. Just a reminder to viewers, if you'd like to join our discussion, you can call us toll-free 1-877-PA-65001 or text us at 717-219-4001. But first, I'd like to give our guests a brief break and tell you about what's coming up on PCN. Join us for On the Issues this week as we meet two more candidates on the ballot in November. First of all, we're joined by Jill Beck, Democrat for Pennsylvania Superior Court, followed by Harry Smale, Republican for Pennsylvania Superior Court. That's Wednesday night, beginning at 6. Tune in tomorrow night for a forum with statewide judicial candidates hosted by Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts and Every Voice, Every Vote. The event streams free with PCN Select tomorrow night, beginning at 6.30. Join us every Sunday this month as we air commemorative programming for the 75th anniversary of cable television, and we recognize Pennsylvania's deep connection to the founders of the industry. 75th anniversary programs air every Sunday starting at 8 p.m. with an encore the following Thursday starting at 7 o'clock. All the great public affairs coverage and interviews you watch on PCN are now available for free online at PCNTV.com and on PCN Select. Thank you for watching PCN. PCN is a 501c3 nonprofit television network that receives no government funding. We're relying on viewers and donors like you to help PCN continue to bring you everything Pennsylvania. To make a donation, visit PCNTV.com. Um, gentlemen, let's get back to our discussion on the minimum wage. Steve, does the minimum wage disproportionately affect small businesses? It, it definitely impacts small businesses. But it, I think more severely impacts, as I mentioned, the nonprofit organizations. But the small businesses are typically, they have the ability to set prices at some level, and they can either increase prices or, or be competitive in other ways. And so it, it does impact them, but it's, it's not the primary place where the, the impact would be felt. And the, the most adverse impact would be felt uh, across the nonprofit sector. Uh, a moment ago, you had mentioned that uh, businesses tend to lose jobs when the minimum wage is increased. How does that get quantified, whether it's lost jobs or perhaps jobs that are not created? It's, it's all of the above. It's, it's certainly it's, it's lost jobs. It's also lost hours in many cases. So uh, if a minimum wage law goes into effect that increases minimum wage, the person who, who was working in some organization has a job. They may not lose their job, but sometimes the hours have to be cut back because the business can't pass along the increases to the customers because because of the structure. So it's 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 across the board. It's impacting in, in a multitude of different ways. Back in 2000, early uh, to 2020, 2021, um, businesses were impacted by pandemic pandemic related closures. Mm -hmm. Does that tie in at all to the ongoing negotiations right now over whether or not to consider a minimum wage increase? I mean, the one thing the pandemic did 
um, is a, a lot of people um, had to get out of, in particular, some of the in-person service industries, so you couldn't go sit at a local restaurant. You could only drive up and get takeout, right? So, and, and obviously a lot of business travel, hotels, et cetera, that all um, in-person con uh, uh, conferences, all that stuff stopped. Um, so, so um, as we rebounded from that, there was a period of time uh, people talked about the Great Resignation, where, where a bunch of workers who'd, who'd left the workforce weren't coming back very quickly. Most of that's gone away. Um, uh, the uh, size of the labor force is still a little bit lower than it was pre-pandemic, but but some of the but the some of the other changes. Um, like how many businesses require their employees to come to work versus teleworking, uh, the amount of business meetings that take place by Zoom instead of you know in person, um, those things have changed permanently, and so um, you know you've had I think some of the reduction of employment in something like leisure and hospitality is driven by the demand side, not just the the worker side, um, but. But in any event, we, we do have a very strong economy now, and we actually have a very high ratio of job openings to unemployed workers, which means it's a tight labor market. Workers have some choice. Um, that's actually part of what's driving the market forces at the low end of the labor market. P employers are realizing that if they want to attract people, they, they have to pay better. Maybe they, they have to offer slightly better benefits. Maybe they have to do flexible scheduling that works not just for the employer, but also works for the worker. Um, so, um, and, and, th and those changes in terms of workers being a strong position in the bottom end of the labor market are, are part of why we can increase the minimum wage now to catch up with Maryland, New Jersey, New York, uh, you know, without um, seeing uh, a loss of employment. And part of what happened during the pandemic, too, was we, you know, we all saw, we all felt the impact of a worker shortage during that time because we saw the supply chains crumbling and it was so hard to get right. products that we needed in a timely manner. And so we saw all that happening, but part of why it happened was because the government, in attempting to deal with this unprecedented situation of this nationwide, worldwide pandemic, decided to, to make uh, a lot of government assistance easily accessible, uh, literally pouring billions of dollars into, into each state and allowing the, the states to decide how, we're gonna, how they're going to use that extra money, uh, making sure that, that different um, programs were available uh, for folks who needed financial assistance, to the point where many individuals were, were empowered to simply say, you know what, I'm not going to go to work for a while. I'm not going to take a job. I'll just, I'll just live on the assistance I, re I received. And, and when that runs out, I'll go back into the job market, that, that sort of mindset. And so that was happening. And I heard that from you know, multiple employers across Pennsylvania during that time were telling me they had workers who were simply not coming back to work until they exhausted those benefits. Then they would call back and say, hey, can I come back? It, it was just a an intervention in, an, and I'm not even condemning the intervention. I'm just saying it was it was a very unusual time. It was unprecedented. No one really knew what the best response would be. Part of the government's response ended up being pouring a lot of money into it, and that empowered folks to to take uh, to partake of the Great Resignation and that sort of thing. But for the most part, that's all now. Those wrinkles have come out as the economy continues to grow. People are back at work generally, and there's still this this tight supply of workers. So. Uh, an interesting kind of a social experiment in some ways to see what will happen. And, and there's a lot of lessons we've learned from that. Uh, part of it is that uh, you know, government policy has an impact on, on the decisions people make. One thing I actually like about this conversation is that the discussion about government is a bit more nuanced than it sometimes is on this show. It, it, you know, that is, the government had a role to play in terms of helping to stem the spread of the virus, did it do it perfectly? Maybe not, but it had a role to play. And in terms of productivity growth, I mean, government uh, has had a, a role to play. I mean, w uh, you go back to the beginning of the U.S. Industrial Revolution, you go to c canals, you go to railroads. Um, obviously, the, the government made foundational investments on which the powerful market economy we then built um, c c could, could be founded. And, and uh, post-World War II, the internet's interstate highway system, the investments that, that, that accelerated in the Eisenhower administration. So, I mean, actually, I think um, 
I think we should do a minimum wage increase, obviously, but I think we should also have the conversation Steve raised before about what are the, some of the other actions people, sh uh, the government should take or government and private sector together should take to, to lay a foundation for productivity growth. He mentioned in, fast, uh, in passing supply chains that were interrupted by COVID. Th those have not been restored completely. There's, there's now an opportunity for U.S., for Pennsylvania companies to supply um, businesses that were supplied by um, Asian companies. There's a bunch of growing industries, including, including partly because of government policies, partly because of the market, you know, renewable energy, clean energy. Prices have come down dramatically. And so you're, you're now getting the growth of um, uh, a technology economy and a, and, a, and a sustainable economy that's going to be a foundation for, for decades of growth. And so having a conversation in Pennsylvania, Governor Shapiro recently announced he's going to have a, an effort working with Team Pennsylvania to develop a, a clearer and more explicit Pennsylvania economic development strategy. So I think we should be having that conversation as well uh, uh, as the conversation about how low wage workers and their families can benefit from growth. Perhaps along similar lines, um, if there are other neighboring states that are functioning uh, with a higher minimum wage, what are those states doing to help support their businesses? What can we learn from them? Again, I, I think, Francine, that the primary factor isn't the minimum wage policy. It's the other policies that mm -hmm. those states have. And it's, it's I, I mentioned tax policy, regulatory policy. And a really important one I forgot to mention was education policy. You know, we're, seeing, we're seeing a revolutionary change that's sweeping through the education system across the country in part triggered by the pandemic, at least it woke up a lot of folks to start thinking about uh, their, the education that their children are receiving and what, what, what options they have. We've seen a real strong push toward school choice opportunities in many of these other states. Part of what is attracting population from Pennsylvania to states like Arizona and North Carolina and Florida is, is part of it's certainly tax policy. There's, there's a really strong correlation there. Part of it is regulatory part policy. Part of it is educational policy and states where there's more choice for parents to access the best education that's suited to their child's need are attracting families. And naturally so. It's an extremely important issue for people. They care deeply about their children and the, the education their children will, re will receive. So one of the things Pennsylvania can do is watch neighboring states. West Virginia, for example, in the last two years has adopted a universal school choice program. Pennsylvania needs to be thinking about the same thing and we have potential uh, potential, we have legislation that's moving that, that, that would cover those things, such as the Lifeline scholarships that even Governor Shapiro has talked about in a very positive light that will allow Pennsylvania to compete for families that are interested in getting the best education for their children. Some of the legislative proposals that are out there right now, um, particularly those by Senator Tartaglione and Representative Kim, would eventually base the rate off of the Consumer Price Index. What do you think about that concept? Um, I think that's a reasonable concept. It's, it's actually, that's a very modest form of uh, automatic increase in the minimum wage because again, as I mentioned, from the 40s to the 60s, Congress every few years, they, they didn't do anything automatically, but they, every few years, they had a, a debate and, and then passed a minimum wage increase. And at that point, it wasn't just about keeping pace with inflation, it was about keeping pace with manufacturing workers who'd been getting 3% a year plus inflation, which is why the, the purchasing power, the value of the minimum wage doubled from the 40s to the 1960s. So I think that's a very modest idea for let's not have low wage workers fall further behind in the future as we grow. So th that should be part of a bill. And to me, if, if we're gonna do that, if we're going to increase minimum wage, I'd, I'm, I'd almost rather see it in the form of one connected with CPI because you wouldn't have to have this political fight every year, every couple years, or, or this constant drumbeat. We've got to rate, like so much political energy and so much productive energy is wasted on arguing about this as I've, as I've proposed, to, as I've characterized it as a not one of the most pressing issues compared to some of the other issues we, we are facing. If we had it connected with CPI and it, it would simply move that way, I think it would take a lot of the politics out of it and just allow it to go forward. I, I'd be okay with that. How much time typically passes between the state increasing the minimum wage? The last time it, it was approved was in 2009. I don't think you can, uh, there isn't really a typical, because <laughs> it depends on the politics. Like I said, nationally, every three or four years, we had minimum wage increases. Then after um, the, the 
late 60s uh, um, and then into the 80s, there was a very long period where we didn't have a federal minimum wage increase. That's when states started stepping into the breach, uh, like California, Washington State, and now 30 states have a minimum wage above the federal minimum wage level. So it, it yeah, I'm, and, and now, again, because of politics, who's governor, but also critically who controls the legislature, we haven't had an increase since the federal hike in 2009. And if you look at the, if you look at the charts of all the different yeah. states and when they've last changed it and what number mm -hmm. theirs is, it's all over the place. You can't, yeah. even, you can't even easily discern any political pattern to it. If there's red states, I mean, there's blue states, there, and they're all mixed up. I mean, it's since about the 80s, the pattern used to be the federal government doesn't increase for a while, then 20, 25 states increase theirs, and then the opposition in Washington um, is reduced because if you're in a state, if you're a Republican legislator from a state that's already ahead of where the federal minimum wage is going to go, you, you know, you don't have a strong incentive to, to oppose an increase. But again, <laughs> symptomatic of the breakdown of congressional process, uh, we, we, we haven't had a, a federal increase since what well, since since that 2009 increase it's the same as Pennsylvania mm -hmm. we haven't, yeah which yeah, is 20 no no not 20 it's 14 years yeah. what's the likelihood that the federal government steps in and supersedes Pennsylvania I mean, I'm not a close follower of D.C. politics because mm -hmm. there's enough to, to, to try to keep track of here but I I think it's probably unlikely unlikely I mean, yeah, it's I more likely it's here. A, it's a political equation, I, and I don't, mm -hmm. I don't profess to know what's going on in Washington, D.C., inside politics at all. <laughs> I, I focus my efforts as well on Pennsylvania. Well, let's we've, talk got about, a, we've got enough challenges as it is. Let's right. talk about the politics. So, um, yeah. What is the political impact of a minimum wage vote in Pennsylvania? You know, I mean, the, the bill, um, the, the based on Laughlin's bill, did passed the House 103 to 100. That seems to imply that one Republican voted for it. Do, do you know? It's, yeah, it's, it, it would be, um, I know who, I mean. You know who it was. I know who it is, yeah. <laughs> okay, you're ahead of me. He's a, <laughs> he's a lobbyist, I'm, I'm an economist. But um, so, um, you know, it used to be thought of that um, voting down a minimum wage increase was something that certainly moderate Republicans didn't want to do. I mean, I don't know, frankly, how many of our Senate districts are considered competitive for 2024. But I think that's, you know, there is there is a political dynamic. Is it strong enough to lead to um, the Dawkins bill based on the Laughlin bill getting over the finish line in the Senate? You know, I don't know, but I think it's, um, uh, again, it's the best chance we've had in, in, in many years. Is there room for negotiation? Oh, there is, and there's there's still so many because the state budget was never actually finished. It's still hanging out there. There's still over a billion dollars that hasn't been allocated that needs to be allocated. And there's there's pieces of the original budget deal that the Senate, House, and Governor Shapiro made that that could easily. There's going to be negotiations, and and minimum wage is a part of those negotiations. That that would be a sensible way uh, to address it, and it could certainly uh, be something that that the parties could agree to if. There were other policies that were adopted that were making a, a strong positive difference for Pennsylvania businesses and families. Does it make a difference if this issue comes up for a vote in a year that the legislature is up for re-election? I, I, I don't know that it's that. I don't think it's one of the ones that, that if you look at like statewide surveys of, of public sentiment, it's not at the top of the list at all. It's, it's simply not. One little facet of this that we have not talked about, if a minimum wage were to increase, how would that affect tipped wages? So... The Laughlin bill, sorry, the, 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 the Dawkins bill that passed the House as a, uh, would increase the tipped minimum wage, which currently in Pennsylvania is 283 per hour as opposed to the 725 uh, regular minimum wage. So the, the Dawkins bill would increase the tipped minimum wage to 60 percent of the um, overall minimum wage, so ultimately to nine bucks an hour. Um, you know, one, one factoid is um, uh, in the last couple of years in leisure and hospitality, which um, there's been much faster growth of employment in the states that have uh, no tipped minimum wage. In other words, tip workers don't get a lower minimum wage, they get the same minimum wage as everyone else. So again, on the employment side, it feels like because of the struggles employers are having hiring people, including people like tipped uh, workers, now is a great time to significantly increase the tipped minimum wage.
We only have a few minutes left, um, but I want to, Stephen, give you, give you a, an opportunity to talk about some of the other things you'd like to see the legislature do. In particular, part of budget discussions this year have involved uh, decreasing the corporate net income tax as well as the possibility of combined reporting. Can you briefly talk about those two? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and even, again, even this is an issue where Governor Shapiro himself has talked about reducing CNI at a faster rate than has already been committed to. And the corporate net income tax reduction would certainly be helpful. It's strongly supported by, by businesses across the state. It's the kind of thing that makes us more competitive with other states. However, if you link mandatory combined unitary reporting to that, it in fact makes the tax situation worse for Pennsylvania businesses, and it negates the whole premise of why we're trying to reduce CNI so we can attract more investment. So that would, that would be a poison pill that would actually damage uh, the situation instead of helping. That's the Chamber's party line. Um, we Keystone Research Center for 25 years have been fine with a lower corporate net income tax rate because we used to be up at what, 10.99 percent? 9.99, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and, um, and, but we've always said it should go along with stopping big companies uh, that operate in multiple states from being able to cook the books so that they artificially lower their taxable income in Pennsylvania. That's basically what this so-called combined reporting does. Um, and in terms of small businesses, small, you know, Pennsylvania only businesses, they, they can't cook the books by um, uh, charging out uh, outrageous um, amounts of money for the Jeffrey, the giraffe trademark that's owned by the Delaware Holding Company, right? Uh, uh, so, which is what Toys R Us used to do. So again, we, we, we'd be fine with that lower corporate net income tax rate. I, I, think, I think we have to worry about long-term revenues in Pennsylvania because we have critical issues around investing in public education after the court decision that concluded we have a, a, an unconstitutional and inequitable school funding system. We have a horribly underfunded sort of 48th, 49th, 50th in the country higher education system. So, um, but, but um, in general, doing a combination of corporate net income tax cuts and making sure that all corporations can't cook the books is something we're okay with. Fortunately, we are out of time. Steve Bloom, Stephen Hertzenberg, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. PCN's John Cole spoke with Representative Mike Cabell about a bill that would prohibit mask mandates in public transportation. What inspired you to draft this legislation? So during the pandemic, I think a lot of decisions were based on fear. Um, you know, we were all kind of scared. Nobody, nobody knew there was, there was no good data or science out to kind of guide us to make these decisions. Um, I heard a lot from my constituents, friends, family that, um, that there was a lot of governments overreach, you know, again, based in fear. We didn't, we didn't know any better. We're here. We are, you know, a long, long time out past the, uh, the, the, the height of the pandemic. And we do have a little bit more data and we understand kind of more what's, uh, what makes sense here in order to govern. Uh, so it just, I think the pendulum swung a little bit too far. And I, I just wanted to make sure that there's some guide rails up so that, um, you know, there's not too much government overreach moving forward. So that was that was basically the inspiration for for the language in the bill. Can you talk about the importance of why you're introducing it right now, then? Yeah. So I, I mean, so uh, again, with time uh, to reflect on everything and, and really uh, the ability to make uh, informed decisions, uh, that's part of it. And then the other part is, um, you know, we are seeing a little bit of a resurgence uh, with, a, I guess, another variant. Um, thank God, it seems like it's not nearly as uh, as um, uh, devastating as previous variants, but um, you are starting to see some people get back into the mask and stuff like that, which is fine. I, again, uh, with the, with our with this legislation, it is, it is the freedom to to wear or not to wear a mask. So I I, I totally respect um, you know, family members that that aren't aren't are a little bit uh, more at risk that that wear masks, and I, I think they should, and that's fine. It's up to them. Hmm. So again, if you don't mind, again, tell our audience right now. So what exactly your proposal would do? Sure. Uh, so what it would do is, is it would prevent mandates uh, specifically um, to wearing masks or showing proof of vaccination on public transit, um, as well as ride share limousines and school buses. OK, so yeah, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, piggyback off of that point. Because, again, you mentioned all the um, in the press release and you just mentioned in that answer right there that it would apply to, again, regional and uh, quote uh, from your press release, quote, would apply to regional and county mass transit authorities, school bus and school vehicle companies, and taxi, limousine, and transportation network companies, 
and then in brackets, Uber slash Lyft, end quote. Can you tell me, so why are all these specific ones included? So it's not just county and mass transit, it's other things beyond that too. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the, the idea, the premise is to just um, kind of take government out of this, out of this entire, and really, really government overreach. Government obviously is going to be involved in some of these public services, um, but it, it's, it's, it's allowing, putting the personal freedom back into uh, people's hands pretty much. So um, we wanted to cast a wide net to, to ensure that uh, we can kind of minimize that government overreach that, that a lot of us saw and, and a lot of us disagreed with uh, throughout the, the uh, span of the pandemic. So just to be clear, though, so in theory, let's say there was an Uber or Lyft driver using their own vehicle and they wanted someone, one of the riders in their car to wear a mask. They would not be able to tell the rider to wear a mask under this law? Correct. Okay. So in theory, so if this law, again, uh, under your law uh, proposal, what would the punishment be for either local counties that would try to enforce something like this or Uber or Lyft drivers, for example, that are trying to require those that are riding with them right. to wear a mask or show proof of vaccination? So on the, on the governmental level, um, we have the ability to withhold some funding. Um, and, and it's not punitive. So if, if they were to repeal those those mandates, we, they would, the funding would then uh, would, would then flow back in, and um, on the on the commercial side, there would be fines associated. And would these fines be levied towards, uh, I suppose, local government entities? Because again, I'd imagine this would be a statewide law that would, I guess, supersede local ordinances. Correct. Cor- correct. Correct. Again, and it wouldn't be punitive. This is my, my, the, the goal here is not to levy fines or withhold any sort of funding. It's just to to allow for these freedoms. So um, if if there were if there was fi- uh, withholding, and, and once they were back in compliance, we we would we would uh, thankfully and openly uh, uh, revisit the funding. So if you don't mind, so how exactly would that work for, again, let's say it's a private company, like, again, Uber or Lyft. So what would the, can you explain to me again what those fines would be like? Uh, what would they look like? So it would, it would be, uh, it would be levied at the uh, corporate level to, to the, to the, so, and, and from there, and then the, that, the entity would then have a decision whether or not what they're doing, uh, what they do based on an individual basis. But that would be, that would be at the corporate level. Okay. So it's not necessarily the individual driver that the fine would be correct. passed along to, Correct. Correct. Okay. Have you talked to others uh, in either the mass transit community or those who work for companies such as Uber and Lyft about your proposal? Sure. So uh, it, again, it's it's what we're trying to do, and and these folks have difficult jobs. You know, what I mean, it's and it's and and a lot of times they're on the front lines, and they're they're certainly welcome to wear masks uh, while they're providing these services. Um, but you know, so, I, I think what happened a lot of times during the pandemic is is um, is that there were some rules made for the few. That really uh, affected the, the entire entire society. So what I'm trying to do is really govern for the for the for the larger majority um, of folks who who are looking to kind of have some civil liberties here. Um, and and back to the so so yeah so it, on the, the the fine thing too. I, I you brought up a good point. So um, it's this this would be a mandate so that the the uh, entity couldn't ma- uh, couldn't uh, uh, mandate masks. It was, like it's not like if you get into an Uber and the gentleman would say, "Hey, please put on a mask." He could potentially say that, and then and the, the individual could say no. You know what I mean? And then then they decide whether where they go from there. This is this is on man mask mandates. That's that's really what it is. Just to be clear on on, on that portion of the of the legislation. Gotcha. So what is where is this bill currently in the legislative process? So it's been introduced. Um, I one of the one of the uh, main reasons I went about it this way is I am on I am a member of the transportation committee. Um, have fantastic relationships with both my chairman. Um, you know, it, it's I, I assume it, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to get this through committee, but I'm willing to do the work. Uh, I've talked. I've had a lot of people who reach out to me. It's gotten a decent amount of uh, of traction uh, media wise. I appreciate you uh, taking some time, John, to talk with me about it. Um, so, so we're gonna we're gonna do all we can to try to get this uh, into our committee so we could uh, have some debate on it. Because certainly there's going to be debate. Um, and I'm open to that. I, I think that's the that's part of the, what um, what I'm trying to do too is is open discussions on a lot of this stuff. Uh, for for a long time, it was just like here's the facts, here's the rules, just comply. That's not we're, that that's not acceptable to me. Like we need to discuss this, we need to debate this. This needs to be debated in community uh, and committee. This needs to be de- debated on the house floor. So that's kind of really one of my other goals is just to get the discussion going on stuff like this. All right. So final question, representative. Uh, again, at, during this process of debating the legislation, do you view certain parts of this proposal as non-negotiable and some potentially that you say maybe we can negotiate that and maybe some tweaks could be made to potentially get more people on board for it? So what I've learned in my short time as a legislator, you have to be 
willing to negotiate in this world, uh, especially in my case. I am a Republican. I am in the minority. So uh, uh, that's all I know. I, I know my, my call, a lot of my colleagues are used to being in the majority and, and, uh, and maybe are, are a little bit less uh, willing to negotiate because just because due to the fact that they haven't had to for a long time. I am. Uh, I, I and, and again, this goes back to the fact that I truly believe that there needs to be a debate and discussion here. I want to hear the other side. So I welcome people to challenge me and, and us to sit down and talk. Anybody could uh, call my, my district offices or my Harrisburg office if they have ideas, concerns. I, I, I want to talk about this because that's the idea. That's that's the beauty of our of our our democracy, our republic, is that we, we could, we're we here to debate and let's get it right. There's There might be things that people disagree with, but ultimately let's uh, do what we need to do in order to get this thing right. Representative Mike Cabell, Republican representing parts of Luzerne County. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. And that concludes today's show. Tomorrow on the PCN Capital Preview, we'll discuss the state's economic climate with David Taylor of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association and Alex Halper of the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. That's tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. I'm Francine Scherzer. Thank you for watching.